Well, good morning. Good, good to see you guys. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Michael, uh, Michael Teller to be exact, so I have some family relation here. <laughs> uh, I think most of you guys know who I am. I've been here off and on. Um, I actually just graduated from Indiana Wesleyan uh, with a degree in Christian Ministries. Yeah! <laughs> Um, so I'm actually going back in the fall to get my Master's of Divinity. Uh, so yeah, more school for me. Yay. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, but yeah, so I got the opportunity to speak here today with you guys. Um, and I have a question um, that I want you guys to consider as we've started this series um, we've been in called Standing in an Upside Down World. And my question is, have you noticed the world you live in? Have you paid attention to the culture and the world that we're in today? Because I think sometimes we don't think about it carefully. We haven't really asked ourselves these questions. We kind of maybe in the back of our minds it's come across, but we haven't really thoughtfully considered and paid attention. Have you paid attention? Have you looked at the world that we're living in today? See, it seems to me, you know, where there's always sort of these debates about, you know, oh, is the world getting better or worse or blah, 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 and whatever. And I can't really answer that question for you, but what I can do is point to some signs of the culture that we are in and the culture that we are living in. One of the things uh, that stands out to me is uh, it seems like there's a lot more voices going on. There's a lot of voices everywhere. It's like there's more bloggers and vloggers or something rather and, and more internet posts and everything you can think of. There's more social media than you can imagine. It seems like there's more voices going on than have ever been before and there's more debates that have never been had because every person is talking to every other person and it seems like, you know, oh that seems kind of reasonable and you know I never thought about it from that perspective and, and it seems almost like there's more mud in the water. Have you noticed that? That there's so many voices and things to consider and thoughts and this and that. And, and no one's really listening to one or two or if it's everyone's listening to everybody. And, well, that seems kind of reasonable. And, and so it's, it's, um, there's more mud. It's getting murkier by the minute. Have you noticed that? It seems like almost Christianity is getting less distinct. As though there's things and people claiming the faith, claiming Christianity, and it, it doesn't really seem like the heart of God is there at all, but there's you know, some sort of you know, statement being made or this and that being supported here and there and all sorts of agendas going on, one thing and the other. And, and it's almost getting harder to discern what is at the core. Have you noticed these things? Something I've noticed also, uh, it seems like advertising is getting more and more radical. And not just how much they, you know, how much they bug you. I mean, that's getting insane how much they're bugging us, you know. But even in how they're appealing to us, they're appealing to our senses more, to the phones we have, the, every, the, the touch and our thoughts and our emotions, even our sin they're appealing to. And even in the television shows that we watch, I've started to notice something, maybe you've noticed this, maybe you haven't, but it seems like in almost every television show, almost every character, even the good guys are living in sin. Have you noticed that? Whether it's some sort of greed or selfishness or alcoholism or um, adultery or some nature of these, it seems like even what is right and what is wrong is being confused in what we watch, so that even what is good is bad at times. Have you noticed that? And see, it seems like for those who are following Christ faithfully, it's almost like we're slowly stepping into a new kind of exile. It's not, we're not being beheaded or killed or beaten but maybe just overlooked, maybe just not listened to, not paid attention. We're not the focus of society anymore. There's so many voices, and it seems like less and less of them is the voice of Christ. You ever feel this way? 
And maybe it's that we're being pushed further and further from the center of our culture, further and further from being the voice where people want to be, and maybe we're moving closer to the sidelines. And as dark and as scary as that sounds initially, it might be okay. Because what I realize is that when we start to move to the sidelines, we find ourselves in pretty good company of those who have followed God. And so we've been in this series on Daniel, and we've been talking about a guy named Daniel, as you could imagine, who lives in a culture that is completely different than his own. He's been taken into exile with some of these other, you know, all of Israel has been taken into exile, um, and they're living in a culture that is so different from their own, so different from their God, A kingdom that has a different structure, different um, values and everything. And here they are trying to live within it. And so today we're going to be picking up in Daniel chapter 2, if you want to flip with me. Um, I'm going to have to skim a lot of it because there's so much in here. But we'll read read a couple verses, don't worry. Um, But Daniel chapter 2, we'll start in verse 1. It says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, so Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. So right off the bat, uh, he's having dreams. You know, everybody has dreams once in a while. And uh, these dreams are very different than your usual dream. It says that uh, his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. And this is more than just, you know, he drank too much coffee at night or something. Um, You know, he just didn't get, you know, the right rest. He was on the wrong side of the bed or something. This is like he's not sleeping consistently. And something in his dreams is really bugging him. So we see his reaction. Um, It says the king commanded here in verse 2. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So we see that to Nebuchadnezzar, there's more going on here. This dream is something really unnatural. It's not just a normal bad dream or, you know, a couple bad nights sleep. This is something different, strange. You can tell by his reaction because he summons enchanters or sorcerers, magicians. Um, It says the Chaldeans, these are just a people group in Babylon who are sort of known for specializing in these sorts of things. They're kind of known as the interpreters um, and divining the, you know, Babylonian gods. That's kind of their specialty. Um, So we can tell right off the bat that Nebuchadnezzar thinks there's more to this. There's more going on. And really, he's not just trying to figure out how to get a better night's sleep he is trying to see something. He's fig- he wants to know what's going on in these dreams because he thinks there is something divine happening. And so you can write this down. He's really frustrated and Nebuchadnezzar is looking for divine meaning. This dream isn't just a simple, you know, oh, I just really want to know what it means or something. If he wants to know the interpretation, it's because he thinks it means something. And he thinks that it's something from God. And so you can tell he's really disturbed. He's frustrated. And so he tells them, hey, uh, I want you to um, tell me my dream and interpret it. And they say, okay, okay, sweet. So you tell us your dream, you know, and then we'll, we'll tell you what it means. And he says, no, listen here. I want you to tell me what I dreamed and what it means. See, there's some sort of growing anxiety because what he doesn't want is a false interpretation. He doesn't want, oh yeah, you know what well, I mean? I guess you know the house could be like, you know, it could be like where you live in your environment, you know, and like, you know, when you're walking out the door, it's like new freedom. You know? He doesn't want just some random advice and some, you know, oh, I mean, I guess it could mean that, you know? And like he knows that's what they're gonna give him. He knows that these people, you know, that anyone can advise you or give you some thoughts or, you know, an alternative opinion. But what he is looking for is something different. He really wants to know what the bottom line is here. This dream is bugging him enough that he says, I want you, I want to know for sure that this is what it means. So much so that they tell him, okay, well, you know, that's kind of unrealistic. And he says, well, if no one can tell me the dream and its interpretation, then I'm going to kill everyone. 
<laughs> try that first, you know. Good luck. <laughs> so they answer him in verse 11, and they say, The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So this is a really crucial point because what we're realizing is Nebuchadnezzar is becoming increasingly in need of a divine answer because these dreams, he thinks there's something significant to him. He really wants to know what it is. He's in need of a divine answer and he summoned all of these people who are supposed to know about these sorts of things. This is their job. These are supposed to be the smartest people out there, his advisors and interpreters. And he summoned them to him and they said, we can't do it. And not only because we can't do it, because what you're asking can only come from God. And frankly, like, we don't really know if our gods are really on our side. I mean, they say um, the the God's dwelling is not with flesh. In other words, what they mean is, I mean, they're just sort of out there. They don't really care. They're not that interested in you and your dream thing and you wanting to kill people. And we don't know how to get the answer from them if we wanted to. And so what you're asking is, is unrealistic. Isn't that sort of what the world is like today still? Doesn't our world look for meaning and purpose? But, the, but we, don't, we don't want God in there, you know. We want to leave him out of it, but we want all the other, we want the answers and the meaning, you know. We want world peace without a God of reconciliation and without the God who is peace. We want love for everyone without holiness and without a holy God. We want freedom for the individual, but we don't want to submit to God. We want hope, something to hold on to, to believe in without the resurrection of Christ. This is sort of the answers we're looking for. Have you noticed that? That it's like this often in our world today, that our world, the culture is moving in a way, we're looking for answers, for hope, for love, for peace, for all these things, but we don't want to find them in God. We want to worship something else. See, we live in a world today where we're looking for meaning and answers from gods who don't have them. And in the same way, Nebuchadnezzar is looking for divine answers and meaning from gods who can't provide them, who aren't there, who he can't get these answers. And so here we, we find Daniel, finally, he shows up here in the text. And uh, what's interesting to me is that so far we haven't heard anything from Daniel. He's not, you know, he's not even in the story. And um, he's not going around causing problems in Babylon. He's not um, disrupting all of the, all of Babylon and Um, he's sort of just living his faith quietly. And here he is worshiping God, and we, we don't hear much to him until the problem comes to Daniel. And here's Daniel's living his faithful life to God, serving God with his companions and his fellow Israelites, and he hears of this decree, and, you know, word gets out pretty quick, you know, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to kill all of his advisors. I mean, I'd imagine that spread pretty quick. And Daniel goes, oh, hey, I'm an advisor, so I uh, should probably pay attention here. <laughs> and so Daniel hears the news that, you know, everyone's going to be killed. And so Daniel does the only logical thing, you know, I'm an advisor, you know, he's going to kill me. So Daniel goes and makes an appointment with the king to tell him the dream. And the interpretation. It's like, sure, I got this. I'll just go make an appointment, head back home. I think that's kind of crazy. It'd be like if, you know, the president came on and was like, uh, I need an open heart surgery. And uh, all of the leading surgeons in the world have decided it's impossible. Uh, But if no one can do it in the next 24 hours, I'm going to kill every doctor in the United States. You know, and then some nurse, you know. Uh, hello, I'd like to schedule an appointment for a 12 o'clock tomorrow. I'll do the surgery. All right, sounds good. See you then. I mean, that's kind of like what's happening here. Um, but so Daniel goes and makes an appointment, and then he returns back to his friends. Uh, we've heard about them, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Um, he returns to his companions, 
And uh, he tells them to seek the mercy from God and they begin to pray. And it says that Daniel receives a vision in the night, which to me means that at some point they've gone to sleep. So they've prayed and prayed and prayed, probably fallen asleep praying. Now they're asleep with no answers and they're going to be killed. You ever done that before? And they pray all the way through the night looking for answers. And God reveals it to him in a vision and they stand in worship. And you see, there's sort of two story lines going on here between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Because as Nebuchadnezzar is growing increasingly nervous, increasingly bothered and frustrated and perturbed, and he's getting more anxious because he's trying to figure out what this means, and he's doing anything he can to get the answers. While he's becoming more anxious, Daniel is becoming more fulfilled, more strengthened, more calm, more steady. That even as he prays in the night, we don't see Daniel fretting or sweating or complaining. Instead, he stands and worships. And so my next thing for you is that Daniel is the foil of Nebuchadnezzar. Let me say that again. Daniel is the foil of Nebuchadnezzar. And what I mean is, is not that you know he's some sort of thing you can wrap up your chicken and put it in the fridge. I mean, <laughs> if you've taken an English class, you might know that he is the opposite, the inverse, the reverse of who Nebuchadnezzar is in this story. Because as Nebuchadnezzar continues to search for an answer that can't be had, as he begins to search and look in all of his kingdom, all his power, all the things he has, all his great advisors, all the smartest people he can get his hands on, and he's getting more stressed and anxious, Daniel is becoming more calm, more filled, more strengthened, more resolved. So that Daniel shows up to this appointment that he made, that he made in advance without any assurance that he would be ready, and he shows up with an answer. And he says to King Nebuchadnezzar, um, hey, I can interpret your dream and tell you what it is. <laughs> and he shows up, and Nebuchadnezzar's like, how can you do this? And he says, listen, it's not because of me, but because of the God who is with me. Notice the parallels here. Nebuchadnezzar comes to his great advisors and says, can you tell me what they are? Can you tell me what this dream means? And they say, we can't because the gods are not with us. And Daniel comes to Nebuchadnezzar and he says, I can because there is a God who is with me. Because there is a God with his, that is with him. You see, there are two different kingdoms going on here. That even while Nebuchadnezzar is living in the biggest kingdom in the world right now, with the most power, the most advisors, he has everything under control. And while Daniel is living in the smallest kingdom that is in exile, that is overlooked, not listened to, that is insignificant, not even a country or a nation anymore. They're just in exile. They're just the people on the sidelines. That Daniel is living in a different kingdom than Nebuchadnezzar is living in. And while Nebuchadnezzar is looking to a God who can't give him the answers he's looking for, who can't provide for what he's hoping for, that can't keep his kingdom what he wants it to be, Daniel is living in something entirely different. And there's a reason that he looks different. And he goes to Nebuchadnezzar and he begins to tell him what this dream is about. And it's not exactly good news. What he tells him is that his dream is about these kingdoms that will follow him. That his kingdom will be overthrown by others and there will be more to come. And each kingdom will be strong, but eventually each will fall. And then there's this final kingdom in his dream that he describes. There's a kingdom that will conquer all of the other kingdoms. And that will stand forever, for an eternity it will be strong 
And really what he's foretelling is the coming of Christ, that Christ would establish a kingdom that would never end. That kingdom is the church. Do you realize that? You're a part of that kingdom that will never fall, never crumble, because it has its root in Christ. And even though Daniel doesn't really realize it, even though he hasn't seen or know who Christ is yet because he hasn't come to earth, he's already living in this kingdom as the followers of God. That even though they are in exile, he is participating, living in a different kingdom entirely. One that is eternal, that is rooted in God. Which kingdom? Which kingdom are you living in? The thing about the kingdom you're in is that it's rooted in the ruler. You see, Nebuchadnezzar has put his trust in something that can't provide for him. Something frail. It may give him everything for a time. And he has the greatest kingdom on the earth for a time. But eventually he falls. And even though Daniel has seemingly nothing at the time, he has a ruler who rules all things. And see, the ruler of your kingdom is who you're dependent on. And who you depend on is who you become like. There's a reason Daniel is different than Nebuchadnezzar. He has a different ruler. And when you depend on your ruler, you begin to become like your ruler. Like the kingdom that you're living in. Like the God you're submitting to. You see, Daniel doesn't, he, we look at this and we think, oh, Daniel just has this faith that I could never imagine having faith like he does. To go stand before a king and, and pray all night and, and do these things. But you don't get it. It's not about what Daniel. It's about who his God is. Daniel's faith is rooted in God's faithfulness. His strength is rooted in God's power. His trust is rooted in God's trustworthiness. His obedience in God's power within him. It's who his ruler is, and he knows that. If we could know that today, wouldn't it change us? And there's a fundamental difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel because there is a fundamental difference in who they serve and who they worship. And it seems like today there is a fundamental difference between who our culture wants to worship and who we do. Because when there's a difference between who God is in who culture is. There's a difference in how you live and how culture lives because we're marked by our ruler and by the kingdom that we're a part of. And when you depend on your king and you live in the kingdom, depending on Christ, you begin to change. It begins to change who you are because you start to look like your ruler. And as we saw, as Nebuchadnezzar becomes more and more dependent on his kingdom, he becomes more and more anxious. He begins to fall apart and lose everything he has. And while David, though seemingly has nothing, though on the sidelines of his culture and his world, is filled and strengthened, 
more and more every day. What kingdom are you in? Which ruler are you depending on? Because it will make a fundamental difference in your life. Who it is you are depending on in your life. Let's pray together.